share screen, share, also, start video, so you guys can see my beautiful face, okay, here we go, right, so, we've talked about multiple theories this term, right, which theories have we talked about already? Theorem. The terms, rational choice, routine activities theories, all of those theories basically had this idea that crime was a choice people made in their lives, right? People are choosing to commit crime and they're criminals because it's a choice. Biological and biosocial theories kind of changed the general idea about how crime happens, right? They, they shifted this idea of crime is not a choice. Maybe criminals are just biologically different or there's something internally different about criminals than non-criminals. On its face, isn't that something also we kind of believe as a society? Isn't that something we kind of feel comfortable with? Why do we believe that criminals are different than non-criminals? Why do we want to believe that? Right? It makes them different from us, basically. Like, right, it's a way to distance ourselves from criminals. We're not criminals because we're not different like that, right? And so we're, this is kind of the first iteration. Again, a lot of this is online, and we're going to move real quick and skip a lot of stuff today but you, you'll be able to get a lot of it online. So um, crime takes place due to these inborn abnormalities is the basic idea. Um, and we got this found in seasonal growth. So now the kind of intellectual history and the, the history of, of um, Dr. Lombroso is he was an Italian surgeon for the Italian army, which is medical doctor. And he compared the physical traits of Italian soldiers versus the physical traits of Italian prisoners. And so there's a, a pretty stark difference here between these two groups. Therefore, maybe there's some sort of biologically different aspects of criminals. Cesar Lombroso was a contemporary. This guy you may have heard of named Charles Darwin. In my mind, probably by Chucky or Charlie or something. But he kind of had this whole idea about evolution, right? That we're all familiar with. Cesar Lombroso kind of took those ideas. They're very popular at the time when Darwin published um, his ideas about evolution, everyone in the world was like, this is awesome, right? And so Cecil Rosen said, I wonder if there's a way to apply this to crim, to cr criminology, or to crime in general. And the way he did that was by saying criminals are just kind of these atomistic throwbacks to an earlier stage in human evolution and they're unfit for civilized life. Now, there should already, in a research method standpoint, something jumps out about comparing Italian soldiers to Italian criminals, right? How was war fought? First of all, what season of Brussels was a contemporary of Darwin, so what years are we talking about right now? In history. The 1800s. That sounds good. The 18 somethings. How do we fight war in the 18 somethings? Do we use predator drones and colon artillery strikes? Right, we use like strength. We use like muskets and swords and pointy things. Would I make a good soldier back then? I would be awesome at everything I do. So you're all wrong. Okay. I'm the best. But people with my general kind of fragile physique would not do well in war, right? Because if we had to use brute strength in a sword fight, my brute strength, it turns out, is roughly down to six year right? And so I would not be a good soldier. So soldiers would be big, burly, strong guys, right? Some might call them chin and tail nest, right? So um, what were prisons like in the 1800s? Were they these warm, welcoming places that fed you well, and treated you well? Not really. So we've got malnourished inmates being compared to some of the strongest members of society. Is there already an inherent problem that we've discovered? Also, what does this assume about Italian soldiers? That they're all good. That they're not criminals. It assumes they're all good people. Is that true? Probably not, right? I mean, I wasn't there, I don't know. But probably not, right? And so um, we have these atavistic throwbacks that have these visible stigmata, right? Um, that you can see asymmetry of your head, monkey like ears, large lips. For those of you who have watched this lecture already, men needed to have five or more of these stigmata to know they were criminal, women three or more. Why? 
Why did men need to have more issues than women did? Or at least stigmata than women did, according to Lombroso. Go ahead. Any death sexism? Well, okay. Sexism in what capacity? Didn't he say something like a female had more injury that they would be too ugly to make us because that way they did it? Right. That's exactly it, right? The idea was. If this is a biological issue, the only way for women to pass on their genetics is if they can get a man to sleep with them. Kind of like the other way a man can pass on his is to get a woman to sleep with them. Apparently, men back in those days, if you were too much of an uggo, we're going to say, nope, I don't think so. Whereas the women had no standards, I guess, and were willing to procreate with less attractive men. And so it was sexism in the sense that no one wanted to breed with a woman that was too ugly, whereas women didn't mind as much. And so, this is not me, this is Lombroso talking, all right? So please don't email HR. Um, here's an example, right? I'm just kidding. Um, but here's actually a real example if you Google atavistic throwback. If you're related to him, I apologize. Um, but this was what Google showed. So, um, so the measurement of features became commonplace in criminal identification, right? Now, taking out the criminal identification element of this, where else in history have we seen measurement of features becoming a key feature of identifying specific types of people? Is there any time in history where people were measuring like ears and noses and, go ahead. The Holocaust. The Holocaust. Mm -hmm. This is something that I really want you guys to think about now, okay? This is very, very serious. Measurement of features became so commonplace in the end of the 1800s and into the early 1900s, when Hitler and the Nazis proposed using it, it wasn't like this idea just fell out of the sky and said, let's measure features. They actually were using science to justify why the measurement of features became okay. So when the Holocaust happened, we always say, golly, how did the Holocaust just seem to, everyone was laughing and dancing and getting along with him. Hitler said, hey, hit those people. Everyone said, oh, okay, that's fine, right? That's not in any capacity how that happened, right? Number one, people were not really happy with Jewish people to begin with, right? And the measurement of features in this reliance on science, look, we're using science. And what do people say? To go against it is anti-science, right? So we can't go against it because we're on the side of science because science is true. As an aside, science is not true, right? There, science is a self-correcting discipline. At one point, science said, the state of scientific inquiry said, if you have an infection, we're going to cut you open and let you bleed out the infection. Do we know now that that's not the best way to go about doing things? Yes, because science is a self-correcting field and a self-correcting discipline, right? But it is not the ultimate truth. It is not any sort of absolute truth in any capacity. Hitler used science quite a bit, and this kind of science to justify what he did in the Holocaust, right? And so, please, 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 one of the worst arguments I ever see on Facebook is people that say, you know, science is true or science says. Yeah, science today says 100 years from now, right, kind of like 100 years ago. We look back at 100 years ago and say, boy, they had some screwed up ideas about life, right? 100 years from now, they're going to say the exact same thing. Because as we get better, as we get more sophisticated, as we get better methods, we're going to realize Every generation is always on the cutting edge of science, right? There, we never step backward in science. It always goes forward. And so we say, oh, well, they were idiots back then. They were the best and brightest people back then. Kind of like our best and brightest people right now. You might look back on it 100 years and say, yeah, they didn't really know what they're talking about, right? And so that's just kind of an aside, but that's something that I think is important to stress to you is one of the worst reasons ever to rely on anything is because science said, if you don't fully understand the science, and just trust someone who's in a white coat that says, this is science, right? 
because I can, I can show you all sorts of examples where probabilistically this is true, but that doesn't mean it's always true, right? Lombroso also identified two other criminal types. This should also give you a very big concern about the theory. Lombroso said the way we know you're a criminal is because you are biologically different, and we can see those biological differences in your visible makeup. Unless you're an insane criminal, which is kind of what we view as kind of like people that have some sort of psychosis and some capacity, or a criminaloid, which is where you don't look at all like a criminal, but you still commit crime. So we know you're a criminal because you're biologically different, and that biological difference manifests itself in you looking weird, unless you don't look weird, but then you're also still a criminal. So who's a criminal then? Everybody. That's not particularly helpful, right? By the way, the theory explained more male features than female features is an exact question. So you should know that. Um, so there's a bunch of other work in um, in biology in some capacity, right? Um, Lombros or Goring largely just proved Lombroso's work. Hooten though found issues in Goring's work. Hooten though in finding issues also had methodological issues. And so you can hear about all this online and read about it in your book. But this interest in biology was actually pretty uh, serious for quite a while. Um, all biological theories had the same basic ideas. They all viewed the environment as largely incidental. Criminals were born, not made and criminals are inherently different than non-criminals. So, by the 1950s, virtually all biological theories were discredited and abandoned, and no one really wanted to talk about biological differences of criminals anymore. Why not? Well, right, but what happened, what is the kind of, why in the 50s, what happened in the 50s and in the 40s and in the 50s, that caused us all to go, ugh, we shouldn't be doing this anymore. Right after the Holocaust got over, right? My grandfather, who we talked about this, uh, went through the Holocaust. Um, maybe we didn't talk about this. Um, but he and his family all went to Auschwitz, where his mom and uh, little brother got killed. His sister got sent off to a different camp where she died. He and his father went to Landsberg. His father died there. And then my grandfather was liberated from Dachau. So, um, after my grandfather routinely would say, I was an inmate at this time. Well, what were you doing then? Oh, I was an inmate then. Because Jewish people were considered criminals, right? And we knew they were criminals based on these measurement of features, right? Checking your nose, checking your ears, checking these different features told us you were, in fact, a criminal. It's a fascinating. And so, because of that, um, in the 1950s, the whole field was like, I never studied that. Nope, done. I don't want to be responsible for that. I don't want Hitler using the work I was doing to justify that, right? So they just kind of stepped away from it, right? The policies were also pretty bad, right? Eugenics and exclusion. If I told you I could solve AIDS today in the world, you'd not be excited. Wow, you have a cure for AIDS? What is it? Take everyone that has AIDS, load them on the spaceship, blast them in the sun. Would that end AIDS in the world? No one has AIDS, you can't get it from anybody, right? Problem solved. I'm a hero. Is that super horrific as a practice? It's a terrible idea, right? And so that's the policy that they consider, though, is if you are a bad person, let's just eliminate you from the gene pool, right? If you are a dog breeder and, and a puppy comes out and it's lame in some capacity, not lame like, like a loser, but like it has trouble walking or something, what do we typically do with that puppy? We denies it right then and there, right? Because it's useless, right? They do this with cattle, they do this with horses, they do this with sheep, right? If it's not something that's going to grow up and produce and be productive, you call it. We don't call it euthanasia, we call it denizer, right? But, um, these are kind of horrific practices, though, when we start talking about, you know, humans. The theories were viewed as simplistic, untestable, and based on ideological biases that weren't true. So we have this new idea of biosocial uh, theories, and, and this says modern biosocial theory, and it shows, it shows that our theoretical perspectives or theories, because biosocial theory is not a set theory, more of a perspective of theories that view um, that abandoned strict biological determinism, which basically biological determinism is genes or your biology causes behavior 100% of the time, 
Um, as new research emerged, it focused on biological variables in conjunction with other social variables. And the main proposition is that behavior results from an interaction of biology and environment. Now, arguably, other than maybe life course theories that we're going to talk about for the end of the semester, biosocial criminology in general and this gene by environment interaction is one of the more complicated theories we're going to talk about. The basic premise is that you have a genetic makeup that makes you sensitive to environmental stimuli. That's important, right? So it's not a gene that makes you commit crime or a genetic makeup that makes you commit crime. It makes you sensitive to your environment. So I have a pretty chart here, right? We have pro-social environments and anti-social environments, right? Pro-social environments are things like two-parent household, uh, affluent, uh, there's discipline in the house, uh, uh, there's not a lot of drug use or, or physical violence in any capacity. Anti-social environments are basically the opposite. Single-parent household, drug use, abuse, not a lot of discipline, not a high emphasis on education. In a negative environment versus a positive environment, we expect there to be more criminality in an in a antisocial environment than in a pro-social environment, right? And this is primary here on the side. However, if you have a genetic predisposition to be sensitive to environment, right? So if you, do, if you don't have that genetic predisposition in a pro-social environment, crime is low. In an antisocial environment, crime is higher, but not super high. The genetic predisposition to environment means in an antisocial environment, crime is really high, in a pro-social environment, crime presumably is very, very low. And taken out to its extremes, this pro-social environment with this genetic predisposition may explain people like Steve Jobs and Bill Gates that are able to, they grew up in this environment and they were just able to pour themselves into something and become super wealthy. It also may explain somebody like, you know, Jeffrey Dahmer or Ted Bundy or something in the anti-social environment where they just went way off the rails, right? And so that's kind of the basic proposition here. This does not claim that there is a crime gene or preordained criminality, and that's important. Um, and that's why it's called biosocial, not biological. It's an interaction of the biology and the social environment. Um, all this you'll see online. So, uh, you know, biochemistry, IQ, neuropsychology, or neurophysiology, um, behavioral genetics. Th this is important, right? So behavioral genetics is the interplay again of genes and environment. But one of the things that is important is shared versus non-shared environment. And crime depends on both. So do any of you have siblings that just well, that are just very different than you? And you don't know why, you don't know how, but it's just you are vastly vastly different than your siblings. You have the same parents, you don't grow up in the same environment, right? However, the non-shared environments also play a role. My sister's high school class is known as, I went to a small parent school, I didn't kind of knew each other, but my sister's high school class was known as kind of like a troublemaking class. They were the ones that were always doing stuff. They were constantly like dumping like the sand in their shoes out and like the librarian's coffee and she wasn't looking and stuff and just doing terrible things. Even though my brother and sister and I were all in the same household, the same parents, and the same more or less genetic makeup, there was differences in our behavior. My brother is a pastor, right? So he is a man of cloth and holy, and my sister and I are not pastors and not quite as holy as my brother is, right? My brother, growing up in church, believes that the best birth control is the Lord. He doesn't want them to get pregnant, they won't get pregnant. It turns out he wants them to get pregnant all the time, right? And he has four sons under the age of five. So my poor sister-in-law is outnumbered five to one <laughs> with boys. Boys are also a little more rambunctious than girls. It's a very high energy household, right? My wife and I are of the impression that the best birth control is she lives in Tallahassee and I live in St. Augustine. There's no chance. Right? Um, my dad and mom got divorced when I was in fourth grade, so it's still new, it's still really fresh. It's hard to talk about. Um, so, thank you, Mr. Um, and when my dad and stepmom got married, there was five total kids in the house. I already said my brother's a pastor, obviously I'm a professor, my sister's a nurse, my stepsister's a school counselor, and my stepbrother never graduated high school. So everybody has college degrees, most of us have advanced degrees, and my stepbrother didn't decide to finish high school. Because the non-shared environments we lived in matter. 
in our neighborhood, the friends he hung out with thought it was a good idea to pick up dog poop and play like, you know, water balloon fights just with dog poop on the ground. Whereas everyone we hung out with thought that was super gross, right? So in our non-shared environments, they were doing really weird things with dog poop. As that matured, right, they started doing weirder and weirder shit and ended up, you know, just deciding school wasn't for them and they weren't going to, you know, keep going. And they've all had kind of just menial jobs throughout life because that's what their, that was his social environment, right? I did not share that social environment, obviously. I'm here with all of you. I'm assuming that you played dog food parts. If you did, was and this was not like it wasn't like it was in the bags, by the way. Just clarify. It was just in their hands. Chucking at each other. It's gross. He also is now a cook in a restaurant, so don't eat there. Um so um adoption studies and twin studies don't matter. Um the specific uh, gene research, specifically DRD2 and DAT1 or P major alleles are associated with deviance in certain environments, and these show propensity toward criminality, but when controlling for things like peer association. The genetic makeup doesn't matter as much because we see here environment there's an uptick with or without the genes right so the genetic makeup isn't nearly as strong a predictor as the, the environment is on which you died in some capacity now do you guys need me to wait here for a second okay we have to spend some time talking about evolutionary psychology also much like everything else, but crime is an interesting thing people like to study. People are fascinated by the study of criminology and crime causation. I'm assuming that's why you're all in this class, because you're interested in why people commit crime. Because of that, people in all sorts of different fields take their field's perspectives and kind of force it on crime, even if it doesn't really fit. That's what Lombroso did as a medical doctor. He was not trained as a criminologist. He did not have a whole lot of training in, in crime or law in general. He was a doctor, he was a surgeon. He tried to force that onto crime. Evolutionary psychology has done the same thing. In evolutionary psychology, basically everything in evolutionary psychology comes down to all behavior can be explained by trying to pass on your genetic material in some capacity. You kill someone because they're competition with you in, in terms of genetics. You steal stuff because you're trying to hoard stuff so that you can have more things to help pass on genetic material, right? Like birds want to build a bigger nest. Humans want to build a bigger nest also, which is called a house. You rape somebody, and rape is the most direct example of this, right? To clearly pass on genetic material, right? Now, the people that seem to really enjoy evolutionary psychology the most, there are evolutionary psychologists, it's a legitimate field, I'm not suggesting it's not. The people that seem the most attracted to it, though, are those friends of yours from high school that graduated high school, didn't really pursue any other further education, but say, I read philosophy at home just for fun, I'm so much smaller than everyone else is. They teach you this obscure philosopher no one's ever heard of in college. No, I can't believe it. How do they not teach you that? Look how wise I am compared to you. You're the idiot that they know to tell, right? These are the people that tend to love evolutionary psychology because it's it's fairly simple. If you say all all behavior can be explained by one thing, that's easy to understand. That's easy to get, right? And then these things, cads versus dads, is this idea in evolutionary psychology where cads are our fathers, kind of like a salmon, swims upstream, has, you know, a thousand baby little salmon eggs, and only 900 of them are going to get eaten like that night, and hopefully one or two make it to the world. That's the basic evolutionary psychology concept of the cat. It's quantitative, get as many kids out there as possible, with as many different women, and your genetic material will survive. Versus dads, which are more kind of like whales or bears or, or other mammals that take care of their young until they reach adulthood and then say go off on your own, but they only have like one or maybe two young, right? Of course, the problem here is this is all tautological, completely untestable. They say crime is committed, right, to pass on your genetics. This also explains way more male versus female crime than it does male A versus male B crime, right? If, if two dudes sleep with each other, it turns out 
100% of the time, you will not have a baby. Write that down. It requires a sperm and, in fact, an egg to have a human baby. And so, male A raping male B, I don't know, these are men and two that passed on, right? There's also, right, a lot of people that you would argue, is stealing a TV helping you? Yes. Is that helping you build a bigger, nicer nest? Not really. Do you need a Lamborghini? Build a bigger, nicer nest. Now, granted, an evolutionary psychologist may say you, you drive the Lamborghini to attract women so you can pass on your genetics, but um, this has similar issues in logic as Lombroso. It's tautological, it's largely untestable, and if any theory is untestable, is it useful to science? Not real, right? And so, because of that, um, this has all been kind of largely um, dismissed from the criminological literature. We're not really all that interested in evolutionary psychology because it's just really largely useless to us. Yet, every now and again, you'll be talking to someone and someone will bring up these ideas, and, or you'll be seen on an airplane, they'll say, oh, well, you study use of criminology. Always just say biology or something else because you don't want to talk to the person next to you. The second you say criminology, you're in it to win it. You're, you may have been a long haul for that flight, and they're going to ask you everything you have on everything. If you just sit there and tell you why you're wrong, even though you know, you know like those mainland for a living, they know. And I'm not diminishing the only thing here is, you know, they just I feel completely unrelated to crime. They'll tell you all about it. Um, so the empirical support is uncertain or weak for most of the biological theories due in large part to the large number of theories. Um, the problems include methodological sampling and measurement issues, as well as um, molecular genetics. That is probably the best future of uh, biological and biosocial of theories of gene by environment interaction. Um, and in terms of policy implications for the deterministic theories like Lombroso, they're super scary and brutal, right? This is shipping everyone to the sun. Selective breeding is an idea to get all the good looking people together and let them breed because they're all pro social um, and put all the others on government reservations. I think pretty people would be okay with this. The ugly people would probably not love those theories of those, those policies. With the interaction, and this is something that's you know, interesting is it's rehabilitation and providing a pro social environment, which are similar policies to all of these other theories, right? And providing more pro social environments, right? Can we change someone's genetics? It turns out that's really hard to do. So you can change the environment and hope to reduce crime, at least some, but changing the social environment is also a policy advocated by virtually every other cryptological. So with that being said, that is it for today. Any questions?